uh, with this seminar. So the speaker is Professor uh, Chikara uh, Furusawa from the University of Tokyo and uh, Riken in Osaka. And he's going to talk about uh, his work and uh, the subject of his talk is about uh, a very hard uh, uh, problem which is predicting evolution, right? And uh, I think he's going to talk about how to study it also with the high throughput to put uh, experiments. So thank you very much for being uh, with us, uh, even if uh, remotely. And uh, yeah, we are happy to hear your talk. Okay, so uh, can I start? Okay. Okay, so first of all, so uh, 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 thank you for the, uh, giving this opportunity to my to present my study. So I'm Chikara Furusa from uh, University of Tokyo and the Rika. Okay, so first, so briefly, so uh, let me introduce myself. So, so I was a graduate student in the Kuni's lab. And at that time, so I studied the theoretical uh, computational biology using the, the simple models, like, like uh, replicating cell model, and to investigate the such universal phenomena in biological systems, uh, like uh, deep slow in the chemical abundance or uh, log normal distribution or something like this. So this is uh, the universal statistical laws in the replicating cells. And I also studied about some uh, sort of organized criticality in the replicating cell model. And also I studied that uh, noise driven adaptation and that uh, differentiation dynamics triggered by cell cell interaction and so on. And maybe that uh, uh, these, these uh, topics are already uh, explained by the Queen's lecture. Yes, and, I uh, could be three. And <laughs> yeah, the last one, I, I, I will talk so. this after. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, so, uh, so, but basically, so that at that time, that uh, simultaneously, I want to see that the real biological system, see and analyze that the real biological systems. And uh, so, uh, after the getting my PhD around uh, 20 years ago, I started the, my own wet experiment experimental studies, and now still continue that uh, uh, enjoying the both uh, theoretical studies and uh, experimental studies in my lab. And today, so because of the, almost all that the theoretical studies are already explained by Kuni, so today I would like to present my uh, experimental works, uh, especially that about that uh, experimental evolution of microbial cells to investigate that uh, some uh, nature of that uh, adaptive evolution. And uh, uh, I afraid that uh, some topic, because that, uh, today's topic is about that uh, experiment, so that I afraid that uh, some topics or uh, terminology or concept are not so familiar with you. So if you have any questions, so please stop my presentation and cast a question, okay? Okay, so that the uh, uh, question to be addressed uh, today is that the uh, dimensionality of the cellular state of changes in uh, adaptation and uh, evolution. So that, uh, of course, that uh, biological systems has the uh, ability to adapt and to evolve to various so environmental changes. And uh, may, so for example, so this is an uh, illustration of the E. coli cells. And they, so when uh, this, we culture that this E. coli cells in the some, for example, stressed environment, uh, some evolutionary dynamics occur that are to overcome this stress environment. And that the question to be addressed here is that how we can describe that the, uh, phenotypic changes during evolution. So in other words, uh, for example, how many, so how we can, so how many so degree of freedoms are necessary to describe and the phenotypic changes that are how so we can extract some variables, so essential to describe that evolutionary dynamics. So this is the today topics. And of course, that, uh, uh, even though that the simple bacteria cells like E. coli consist of huge number of components like uh, protein and the metabolite and so on. So, that, so this system has a intrinsically, so very high dimensional system. Uh, but when we consider that the complicated cellular function like uh, cell replication, that the amount of such huge number of components need to be changed. So somehow very so uh, coordinate manner and such correlated dynamics can reduce the number of effective degree of freedoms. 
So for example, so let us consider a very simple case in which the cellular state is represented by the uh, expression level of the three proteins. So we can describe that the state uh, of the uh, some cells in the uh, three-dimensional space and uh, its time development can be described as the trajectory in the, this three-dimensional state. And if the uh, time development of the state in the evolution can be described uh, like uh, this kind of line, so uh, this dynamics should be described in the three uh, dimensional dynamics, the so degree of freedom is necessary to be three. Uh, but if that uh, they are, so that the expression level of the, these three uh, proteins are somehow correlated that, like this, so we can set new axis on this line, so the state change can be described as a uh, single degree of freedom. So that the, so the question is that, the, of course, that the such correlated dynamics can reduce the number of effective degree of freedom, and the question is that how many degree of freedoms are necessary, for example, to describe the evolution dynamics of the E. coli cells, single bacterial cells. And of course, there is some the theoretical background. So I guess that uh, Kuni already explained by the, this uh, theoretical studies, um, but very briefly that uh, uh, by the assuming that the steady growing state and uh, possible phenotypic changes somehow constrained on the low dimensional dynamics and uh, this theoretical prediction such as uh, uh, protein expression changes for protein expression change ratio are common for all proteins. This is a correspond, which correspond to the growth rate changes that this is a theoretical prediction and uh, it agreed well with that uh, experimental data. And uh, we also studied the how such that the low dimensionality emerges and during evolution by using that uh, very simple uh, simple cell model, uh, we in which that uh, very simple auto uh, catalytic networks, uh, cell with a uh, simple catalytic networks evolved. And after, after the evolution, the possible phenotypic changes can uh, uh, constraint on low dimensional dynamics. So this is a theoretical work. And with this background, so uh, we try to uh, analyze that uh, such uh, low dimensionality the evolutionary dynamics uh, in the type by using that the experimental evolution of that the simple bacterial cells. And the experimental, so okay, let me move to that wet, wet part, wet experimental parts. So that uh, I use the experimental evolution of the bacterial cells. And uh, here I would like to present such a methodology. And uh, experimental evolution is a very simple uh, method. Uh, sim uh, basically, that uh, we culture that the uh, uh, cells for a long time, like, uh, for example, typically that the, uh, with the constant time interval. So we take that the some port, uh, part of the cell to so the uh, transfer to the fresh medium. So iterating this and they, pro for example, that the uh, propagation, so we could uh, observe that the evolution dynamics. I mean that the, and when so that the, so with that the iteration of that the expansion and the selection for the long time, so once some cells has that the higher fitness, like uh, for example that the higher growth rate, that the progeny of the these cells uh, uh, increase at the ratio in the this whole population and eventually that the, uh, take over the whole population. And so this kind by using that this uh, long term for, uh, cultivation of the, the cells, so we can observe the evolution dynamics in the wet lab. So this is a very simple uh, experiment. So of course uh, it's a bit tough work, but the methodology itself is a very simple. And this experimental evolution uh, has a very several advantage uh, in comparison with uh, and the ordinary. Uh, method for to analyze that the evolutionary dynamics. So basically that the study of the evolution dynamics is based on the reconstruction of the, the past event based on the, for example, fossil data or a genomic sequencing. And but of course that such reconstruction of the past event of the evolution is suffered from that, for example, missing data or some that missing links or something like this. But uh, experimental evolution has uh, many advantages that we can directly access that the initial state or final state or transient state of the evolution. So we can, st uh, we can store that the all samples during the evolution. So we can access these all samples and also so we can control the evolution uh, environmental conditions. 
And also that uh, by using the replica experimental version, so here that the replica experimental version means that uh, starting from the identical initial condition and identical environmental condition, so we can so uh, maintain that the replica experimental version series. And by comparing that the result of the, this replica experimental evolution, so we can discriminate the fat uh, necessity changes, ne ne fat phenotypic change or genetic changes that occurred unnecessarily, or uh, fat uh, changes occurred by chance. So this is a big advantage to understand the fat data universal nature of the evolutionary dynamics. So, so answer. Uh, okay, so that uh, uh, here I would like to present uh, some uh, two examples for that uh, uh, experimental evolution of the bacterial cell studies. And one is that uh, uh, very pioneering works by uh, Richard Rensky and uh, for that the long term cultivation, long term so experimental evolution of the E. coli uh, for that more than 30 years. So he started in uh, 1988, so that uh, uh, he studied that uh, long-term cultivation of the E. coli cells. So basically, that, that they uh, uh, you know uh, transfer that the E. coli cells for the uh, 24 hours time interval. So here, the working volume is around uh, 100 milliliters, that medium, and that uh, transfer and transfer transfer the long term, and by you and for every one week so they take uh, uh, they store that uh, uh, frozen stock that each samples and by analyzing that this uh, huge amount of the samples so we can analyze the how that the fitness changes the how many mutations are fixed fixed during the, this long term cultivation so here in this figure that the x axis is the generation here in the around that uh, 2000 generation this is a big uh, Long term, but uh, maybe uh, this is around uh, 10 years or uh, that, uh, 15 years or something like this. But anyway, that, that this uh, green dot is at the increase of the fitness. So it early stages that the fitness increased at the laboratory, but the gradual uh, increase that continue for a very long term. And the uh, blue dot is the number of the mutations, and it increased uh, almost linearly or something like this. And so this is the analysis of the uh, Changes of the uh, genetic changes during this long term cultivation. In this case, it's at the uh, x axis generation for the 60,000 generation. This is around the 30 years uh, cultivation. And here, that the, each, each figure shows that the result of the replica uh, series of this long term experimental evolution. And y axis is the allele frequency. This means that the, sum, the ratio of the uh, E. coli cells having the one mutation. And we, uh, so you can see that some rapid increase of the allele frequency means that uh, here that the one mutation emerges and these uh, cells uh, with these mutations uh, occupy that uh, increase that ratio and that eventually that all cells have that this mutation or something like this. So uh, you can see that uh, many, many, so many times that some mutation arises and are fixed for the whole population or something like this. And this is a very so informative so uh, data to understand that uh, how that the E. coli cells are adapted to uh, one environment, and there's many findings, uh, unexpected findings. For example, in this region, so you can see that that uh, some mutations occupied that uh, around that uh, eighty percent, and some others uh, others does not have that this mutation occupied around the twenty four. Uh, 20% or something like this. So in this region, that the two uh, different so state cells with two different states coexist so so very long time. So here is that around that more than several years. So they coexist, even though that, that this uh, experimental evolution started a single genotype. But uh, uh, after that long term cultivation, that, that there are two cells with two state emerges and coexist. And this coexistence is very interesting because that, that if that, that this uh, if that, that uh, so there is only one carbon source is like glucose, so if uh, some cells has a higher growth rate for the, this environment, that they over uh, they eventually that, uh, occupy the whole population. But in this case, is that the coexistence can be maintained very long term. And in this case, there are two phenotype images. One is that. Uh, 
good at uh, utilizing the glucose as a carbon source, and others is that uh, some other phenotype that uh, utilizing that the byproduct of the, this major population. Here, that the byproduct is acetate. So that the, this major population that the, takes the glucose and some part of the carbon transfer the acetate, and this minor population that utilizes this acetate as a carbon source or something like this. Uh, so, uh, actually, the more complicated interaction might be the, around the, these two population, but uh, this is a very non-trivial unexpected result in this uh, Lens gives a long term calculation. Okay. So, and the uh, so next example is that uh, uh, around the visualization of the antibiotic resistance evolution of the E. coli uh, done by the uh, Roy Kishonese group in the, uh, Israel. And in this study, so they prepared the uh, big, uh, huge uh, gel plate, it hit it more than the uh, 100 centimeter, so very, very big, so agar plate, uh, in which that, uh, they prepare that the stepwise increase of antibiotic concentration. Here, that, so 3,000 or 300 is the concentration of the antibiotic trimetoprim. And uh, both uh, end of the, this huge agar plate, so they inoculate E. coli cells and um, uh, and observe that, that uh, how this uh, E. coli cells spread on this huge agar plate. Here, I would like to show that the movie of the, this study. And here, th this is a uh, huge agar plate uh, with uh, the stepwise increase of the, the antibody concentration. And at the both end, so they inoculated the E. coli cells and uh, with the antibody they spread. And here is uh, some uh, uh, stepwise increase but antibiotic concentration so they cannot grow at, uh, at first. But as you can see that the, at, at some point uh, E. coli cells uh, start to grow in this uh, in, in the presence of the antibiotics. Here that the, at several point they acquire that the resistance somehow and the spread on this agar plate like this. And, uh, and that the point is uh, reached that the next stepwise increase of antibiotics, but some cells are uh, overcome this increase of the antibiotics concentrate, antibiotics, and and eventually that uh, so they can overcome that the stepwise increase of the antibiotic concentration like this. And as you can see that the some patterns here that the, this uh, represents the evolution dynamics of the, the antibiotic resistance evolution here, around here. Okay. And so from this uh, agar press, so, so we can take the samples and, uh, and analyze that the genetic changes like uh, sequencing analysis by which so we can draw that this kind of the family tree so that the, some one single cell takes that the antibiotic resistance around here and the spreads that the progeny is spread around here and so on. So uh, by this methodology that they can visualize that the resistance evolution like this. Okay, so that is clear. So uh, if you have any questions about this kind of experiment, so please stop me. Okay, so uh, and so okay, let's uh, move to that my own study. So uh, by using the, this kind of the, the experimental evolution of the, the bacterial cells, so and to understand that the dimensionality of the uh, evolutionary uh, possible phenotypic changes in evolution, so uh, we uh, started that the systematic experimental evolution and that, that the various so different environmental conditions. Uh, I mean that the, okay, let us consider again that the, some uh, state space, phase space in which that the each axis correspond to that, the, for example, uh, gene expression level. And that here is that the parent strain that, that is state space. And by performing that the experimental evolution and that the different environmental conditions, uh, like uh, for example, that the uh, exp uh, environmental condition A, so that they ch uh, state changes are in this direction, and the environmental condition B for this direction, and so on. And by performing the, this kind of the experimental evolution for the, the enough large number of the, the different environmental conditions, different selection pressure, and uh, uh, quantifying the, the phenotypic changes or genetic changes, so we expected that uh, we can uh, 
draw that the uh, that the how we can analyze the how that the state uh, spreads the in this the high dimensional state of space. And by this information, so we can understand that the structure or dimensionality of possible phenotype space of the, this E. coli cells. So this is the part we want to do. And, and the question is how uh, we can estimate the uh, effectivity group freedoms or how we can extract some mas macroscopic variables to describe that the possible phenotypic change of the E. coli. So this is the part we are trying to do. And so now, okay, so, uh, Today, so I would like to present uh, this kind of the ongoing works. And as I said, that the method of the experimental evolution is very simple, that the uh, culturing E. coli cells, for example, that are very long time uh, in the given environment. But in this project, so we want to analyze that the evolutionary dynamics with uh, many different environmental conditions. So, so this is a bit tough work for wet biologists. So to maintain that uh, such a uh, large number of that uh, experimental species. So this is a very, very, very uh, hard work. And uh, such uh, hard works can limit uh, the number of the possible environmental, number of the possible environmental condition or number of replica experiment. And to overcome, so this uh, limitation, so uh, we uh, developed uh, some uh, device as an automated system designed for the experimental revolution, uh, uh, which consists of the, the liquid handling system uh, connected to the shaker incubator. Here is the shaker incubator, and here is the micro plate reader by which we can uh, quantify that the, uh, cell concentration. And, uh, and based on the result of the, the quantification of the cell concentration that the, and that some algorithms, so we transfer that the fresh medium and adding that the stress, uh, stress uh, chemicals and go back to that incubator again. And here that we, uh, in this incubator, so we can maintain the, uh, uh, around uh, 40 uh, microprets. So by which that uh, uh, more, uh, more than 10,000 uh, independent culture series can be maintained in the fully automated manner. So what so wet biologists need to do is just uh, supplying that uh, uh, fresh medium or new chips or something like this and uh, all other things were done by this uh, automated system. And, and by using this system, uh, we started the experimental revolution under the various different uh, environmental conditions. And uh, as a first round, so we performed the experimental revolution under the 95 uh, different uh, stress environment, uh, which included that many inhibitors of the cellular functions like a uh, cell wall synthesis inhibitor or a protein synthesis inhibitor or a replication inhibitor. So many compounds that, that, that inhibit these cellular functions in the different action mechanisms. And also these stress involved that the surfactant or a chelate or a metal or uh, some organic acids or others include the many compounds that, uh, that surprise that the cellular growth of the E. coli. So um, by using that, that this, these many stresses with different so mechanisms, so we uh, try to investigate that uh, how uh, E. coli cells can overcome these stresses. And so this uh, slide shows that the method of the experimental revolution. And the cells were cultured in the synthetic medium. So here, synthetic medium is a very uh, pure medium. It's uh, all component uh, that uh, uh, were defined like uh, carbon sources or buffer or something like this. But anyway, that we culture that the E. coli cell in the synthetic medium with the concentration gradient uh, of the one stressor. And in low concentration range of the stressor, E. coli cells can grow. And in high concentration ranges, they cannot grow. And uh, every 24 hours uh, from the well with the highest concentration of the stressor at which cells were able to grow uh, cells were transferred to the fresh medium uh, with the concentration gradient. And by iterating this daily propagation, so we expected that uh, uh, this uh, concentration that uh, with the uh, higher, highest concentration for the cell growth is uh, increased. Uh, this means that the uh, E. coli cells acquire the resistance to the corresponding stresses. And to quantify, that the uh, uh, resistance, so we use the minimum inhibitory concentration and the concentration of the stress like around here. Okay. 
And so this is a uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, result uh, of that uh, one uh, example of the result using that the sulfur. So this is a kind of the uh, antibiotics uh, that that kill that uh, E. coli cells. But anyway, that uh, here that the x axis is a time so that uh, we perform that uh, twenty seven days daily propagations, uh, which roughly correspond to the three hundred generations of E. coli, and Y axis is that the log transformed minimum inhibitor concentration of this sulfur succitazole. And to check that the reproducibility, reproducibility of the evolution dynamics, so we maintain the six uh, independent culture series starting from the same uh, E. coli cells. And uh, we draw that uh, six line here, here. And as you can see, that the uh, uh, MIC uh, gradually increase like this. This means that the E. coli cells. Uh, acquire the resistance to the corresponding drugs is sulfur succitazole in this case. And so uh, we perform that this kind of that uh, they uh, serial transfer experiment and that addition to many different types of the stressor like this. This is only the part of the result of the, this uh, systematic experimental evolution of the ecoresses. And uh, as you can see that uh, for some stress, uh, stress is that the MIC gradually increase like this, and for, for some uh, stress is that, that they increase stepwise manner like this. Maybe that uh, in this case is that uh, E. coli cells has a uh, single mutation stochastically, but in case is not, but in this case is that uh, many uh, complex phenotypic changes occur, something like this. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, so among the, the uh, 95 stresses we inspected, uh, we obtained that the, we can observe that the significant increase uh, of the MIC for the, the 87 stress, uh, stressors. Uh, and among them, uh, among them, so we selected that the 48 stresses and the four independent evolved line and 192 evolved uh, lines in total for further detailed analysis. So to analyze that the phenotypic change or genetic changes. Okay. Okay, so, and uh, first to uh, analyze the phenotypic changes, so first we quantify how the acquisition of the resistance to the one stresses changes the resistance or sensitivity to other stresses. For example, in the case of the, the chloramphenicol uh, resistance strain, so in this case is after the 20 uh, seven day, daily days daily propagation that we obtain that the four Chloramphenicol resistant strains. And uh, this uh, chloramphenicol resistant strains show that the significant increase of the MIC to the acryflavin to so different types of the stresses. Yeah. Uh, uh, such the increase of the, the different types of the stresses is so called cross resistance. And so uh, we uh, Quantify that the MIC level for that the all uh, that the many stresses indicated we investigated 47 stresses. So uh, among that the 47 stresses, we uh, found that uh, for 15 stresses that the, this chloramphenicol resistance strain showed a significant increase uh, of the MIC. This means that the cross resistance uh, can be observed for that the 15 stresses. But for some other stresses these chloramphenicol resistant strains became more sensitive to the some stresses like this. Here that the MIC, uh, uh, MIC so significantly decreased for the some stresses, which is called the collateral sensitivity. In this case, it, uh, so chloramphenicol resistant strains show that the uh, collateral sensitivity for nine stresses out of the 47 stresses. And so we, uh, quantify that the change of the resistance, the all possible pairwise combination of these 48 stresses, uh, which is more than that 2,000 combinations. And so this is a bit tough work, but by using that automated system, we can quantify that this kind of that, uh, systematic uh, quantification of the cross resistance and uh, collateral sensitivity, and found that uh, around 25% of the combination, pairwise combinations, and they show that significant changes of the uh, resistance level, like uh, cross resistance, uh, cross resistance or collateral sensitivity. So, so this result suggests that the E. coli cells cannot change the resistance levels uh, 
for the one stresses uh, independently uh, of the other stresses. Instead, that the mechanism of the uh, resistance acquisition of the uh, became sensitivity is uh, somehow very tightly interconnected, uh, which uh, constrains the possible phenotypic changes we call in this case. So, so this result so suggests that some, somehow uh, possible uh, phenotypic changes are uh, constrained on the some, some low, dim, uh, low, low dimensional patterns. Okay. And so this uh, this figure shows that the position of the mutation identified that this these uh, 192 uh, resistance strains, and here that the x axis is at the genome position. The uh, E. coli cells has at around the four million base pair genome, and the y axis is just the index of the uh, uh, evolved strains. The first four is at the clan finical evolved strain. The uh, second four is the refined evolved strain, and so on. And uh, let dot. Uh, represents the, some position of the mutation. And for some stresses, the number of mutation is uh, much larger than others. So this is that uh, this stress itself it can be uh, act as um, uh, some compound causing that uh, some mutations so that so-called the mutagen. Uh, but anyway, that uh, uh, we found that the number of the fixed mutation of the, these uh, evolved strains are relatively small, that the more than 80% uh, of resistance strains uh, have that less than five mutations. So that this is the distribution of the number of mutation for the, this uh, around the 20, uh, 20 evolved strains. But anyway, uh, that the number of the mutations is almost always that less than five. So very small number of the mutations are identified. And <clears throat> And so, and among them, so among these mutations, uh, we selected that uh, uh, 64 mutations uh, which are commonly uh, fixed to that, uh, uh, different evolved strains uh, to uh, investigate the effect of the, these mutations. And the data is a very so much that, uh, but we found that many mutations that affect that the resistance level changes, like for example, uh, in this case is that uh, uh, we introduced that uh, uh, mutation at the uh, RS genes, uh, which is involved some stress uh, response machinery. But anyway, that uh, by introducing that the uh, mutation that uh, this RSSB genes into the parental strains, and uh, that the uh, MIC level to the various different uh, stressor. Here is that the X axis is a named stressor, and the Y axis is that the uh, changes of the, the resistance level, so relative MIC uh, to the parent strain. But just introducing the single mutation that is for some stresses that the MRC increase, be, in, this means that the uh, resistance acquisition were observed. And for some st stresses that the, uh, this mutant, uh, mutant became more sensitive to the some stresses. So uh, we uh, obtained that this kind of data for the many mutations, but uh, data is uh, too much to present here. But anyway, that uh, this kind of the many mutation were observed. So, uh, so for the days uh, around the uh, two uh, hundreds uh, resistant strains uh, for the environment and uh, for independent uh, evolved strains, so we quantify that the change of the resistance or sensitivity to many stresses, and that uh, we uh, analyze that the genetic changes for, and also we quantify that the, how that the gene expression changes. Uh, in comparison with the parent strains. And okay. by using the, these high-dimensional data... So, Excuse me? Yes? So you yes. have four evolved strains for the same environment. So are they, do they have some common mutation or they are often different? Yes, uh, so in some cases, yeah, so it is a bit difficult, but in some cases that the common mutation were found in the, the same, same, so... Uh, evolved strain at the same environment, but for others that uh, many different mutations cause that are similar phenotypic changes. Uh -huh. So here that the genotype phenotype mapping is uh, very complicated. Okay. So basically that uh, several mutations are common, uh, but uh, many other mutations exist. Okay. Variety of the mutations were observed. Any other questions? This moment, okay. No, okay, okay. So, so, uh, oh, okay, in yes. this, <coughs> hmm? 
Okay, so uh, in this case, is that uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Yes. So, uh, so the, the the way to analyze uh, to extract your data is that you determine for each stress what is the minimum concentration uh, at which there is resist uh, at which I mean the minimum concentration at which there is mm -hmm. no uh, re replication anymore. There is no. Um, evolution anymore, right? You have for each stress there is a different. Exactly, that's that's my question. The minimum inhibitor concentration you have to determine for each type of stress. Is that correct? Yes. And this is what you so, analyze. Uh, what you... Yeah. So every day, so we quantify that the so cell concentration with different uh, uh, different uh, drug concentration, right? And uh, so by uh, by this data, so we can determine that uh, we can determine that the minimum inhibitor concentration and below uh, minimum inhibitor concentration, we take that the cells to uh, trans uh, transfer the fresh medium. And from this sample, this, you, you you do the genomic uh, sequencing, yeah. right? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, so okay. So after that, the three hundred generations. So we take that the single clones. Uh, at the end point of the experimental evolution, okay, and apply that these samples to the, the genetic uh, genomic analysis. Okay, okay, thank you. So, so in this case, is that no heterogeneity. In, uh, so, so we as uh, analyze that the heterogeneity of the, the genotype or phenotype in the, at the end point, but all uh, in this case, the selection pressure is very strong, so that the not so high heterogeneity were observed. Okay, so, uh, so, oh, thank you for your question. At, so, and that uh, we analyze that uh, uh, from the uh, clones that are isolated at the end point of the experimental evolution that are under uh, 200 clones. So, we quantify that the uh, uh, expression changes and that the quantify that the change of the resistance to that the various different stressor and the change of the genetic sequence and analyze that the relationship between the disease phenotype and the phenotypic and the genetic data. And so uh, we have tried the many uh, methods to uh, analyze uh, these phenotype genotype mapping, uh, but basically that uh, uh, as Kuni uh, just a question, but, but uh, uh, genomic correspondence between the, the genetic changes and the phenotypic changes is not so clear. Uh, I mean that the many different uh, mutation causes that similar phenotypic changes. Uh, but uh, uh, these two data, that the resistance profile and the uh, transcript data is uh, very well correlated. So by using this data, so then we analyze that uh, some constraint on that possible phenotypic changes. And for this purpose, so for, uh, we uh, tried uh, to predict that the change of the resistance level. So we uh, analyze the feather that this change of the resistance level to that the 48 environment, virus environment, can be predicted just based on that the changes of the gene expression level. So here that the uh, objective variables is that the resistance, MYC for that the 48 environment, uh, for that uh, 200, uh, 192 strains, and that the explanatory variables is at the expression level of the thousands of genes. And we uh, check the feather that uh, this change of the uh, resistance can be predicted based on that, uh, uh, expression level of the thousands of genes. And for this purpose, so we use a very simple method, so-called uh, partial list square regression, PLSR. So in this case, it's, uh, uh, in this method, so both that the high dimensional uh, expression matrix and uh, expression data and the resistance data are projected onto the, the small number of the component with some loading. So this is a linear, basically linear algebra. So, so we, uh, these uh, high dimensional data are projected on the small number of component uh, with some loadings. And in PCA, principal component analysis, the PCA are determined by the, the, uh, to maximize the variance on this component. 
Uh, but uh, in PLS, that uh, uh, loadings are determined by the, the maximizing the covariance between that these uh, uh, project components, and by which that we can extract is that a good axis to represent is the relationship between the two these two high dimensional data, and then that after that this uh, production so that we use that linear regression uh, to predict. And uh, that uh, changes of the, the resistance level based on the, the expression level. And here the question is that uh, how many components are necessary to uh, per, uh, to predict the change of the resistance level? And to uh, uh, to check that this uh, we use that so called cross validation that the data are split onto that the test data, training data, and the test data, and that the uh, parameter that fit by that. Uh, Training data and that the prediction accuracy were evaluated by test data. And in this figure, that the x axis is the number of component, number of component, number of axes are uh, used for the uh, pro, uh, prediction, and y axis is a prediction error. And as you can see, that uh, so prediction error became minimum around the nine or ten, uh, nine or ten. So this means that the uh, this is the best for this uh, degree of freedom, the best for the prediction, and this. Uh, figure show that the prediction accuracy uh, here that the x axis is a uh, observed resistance here that the observed re uh, resistance is uh, uh, quantified but the uh, uh, log transformed MIC ratio to the parent strength here that the positive value is that the resistance the acquisition and the negative value is uh, became more sensitive due to the collateral sensitivity and the y axis is the predict uh, uh, predict the resistance and as you can see that and that the uh, prediction accuracy is aware. So even, even if we use uh, just uh, uh, nine components, so high, be, high, high, very high dimensional, so expression data somehow predicted on the only that the nine or 10 uh, axis component, and by which that we can predict the uh, changes of the, the resistance level to the various different stress. Star. So this means that the possible, possible expression changes somehow constrained on the, the low dimensional uh, Space so by which that we can predict the behavior, change the behavior for the uh, stress resistance. So this results also suggested that the uh, possible phenotypic changes are somehow constrained on low dimensional data like a nine or ten degree of freedom. And the next question is that how we can interpret such a load uh, axis is component for the such uh, low dimensional dynamics. And this figure shows that uh, uh, project. Uh, Expression profiles projected onto that first three component uh, of the PLS analysis, and each dot represented the state of that uh, evolved strength. And the question is how we can interpret these axes. And for this purpose, so we perform the so called the uh, enrichment analysis. I mean that the fat gene function are in, uh, significantly enriched on the, the high loading genes for each component. And, and as a result of the, this enrichment analysis, so we found that for the component one, the first component, and that the genes are related to the stress response uh, has a, a strongly a significant uh, contribution to that component one. This means that, that this axis uh, represents the how much stress response machinery of E. coli has somehow activated. So this is a stress response axis. And in the same way that the component, in the component two, that the aerobic risk genes are related to the aerobic respiration and the membrane transport are significantly enriched. So this uh, suggests that this component two are somehow related to the growth activity because that, that this aerobic respiration is very important for the cellular growth and the membrane transport is also very important. And uh, in fact, that the score on this component two are correlated well with that the growth rate of the, these evolved strains. So this uh, result supports that this component two is that uh, represents the growth activity. So this is a growth active, growth axis. And in the same way that the uh, component three are that, uh, uh, related to the amino acid biosynthesis, uh, uh, especially that the branched chain amino acid. But there, of course, that the amino acid is somehow uh, very important for the cellular growth, but at the same time, that the amino acid is a uh, uh, production of the amino acid is also very important for the stress protectant. 
So, and the third axis is amino acid biosynthetic activity. And other axis also can be interpreted by, for example, so this axis is corresponds to anaerobic respiration, or this axis corresponds to glutamic acid synthesis or something like this. So, so we found that the possible uh, ex, uh, uh, expression changes somehow constraint on so low dimensional space, and uh, in which that each axis can be interpreted related to the cellular function. So we uh, named the major somehow so major axis is, but anyway that uh, and evolutionary dynamics are somehow constrained on this these major axes related to these cellular functions like uh, stress uh, stress response or growth or something like this. So we can describe that the evolutionary dynamics to the various different environmental conditions by using that these uh, small number of the axes. So this is that uh, uh, what our systematic experimental evolution studies suggested. Okay. And so in, in another, uh, in other words, so uh, this, our result uh, indicated that, that uh, uh, two high dimensional phenotypes space, as uh, one is that the expression space in which that the each axis represents that the expression level of the different genes are having that the several thousand dimensions, and uh, in the resistance space in which that the each axis corresponds to that the resistance that the different stresses in our analysis around that the 100 or something like this. But anyway, so these uh, two high dimensional state of space can be connected through that the low dimensional future spaces are under having that the, uh, nine or 10 degrees of freedom, something like this. So this is that our uh, experimental evolution that indicates. And for the next step, for the next step, so we started, uh, we try to analyze that the trajectory of that the evolutionary dynamics. So uh, in the previous analysis, so we, uh, isolated the clones at the end point, at the end point of the uh, 300, uh, 300 generation of experimental evolution, but the actually the evolution within the evolution dynamics, the phenotypic the gradual changes, so this, is, this can be described by the trajectory in the, the phenotype space. Uh, but the, uh, to analyze that such trajectory in the, the expression space, so this is possible. So for example, by taking that uh, messenger RNA samples for the every day and that the uh, by which we can draw that the trajectory on this high dimensional expression space. And uh, this is possible, but it's a bit um, too hard work, too tough work for the uh, experiment. So, but instead of the uh, trajectory in the expression space, so we can analyze that the uh, trajectory in the resistance space. This is a uh, relatively easy by using that the automated system we developed. For example, let us consider the case cases and then the, in which the stress one is uh, used for the selection stresses. So E. coli cells are uh, selected uh, by that uh, uh, resistance, the stress one, but at the same time that the uh, uh, resistance uh, of the, the stress two to stress n uh, are, can be so quantified. So MIC levels can be quantified. And by uh, after the selection of the stress one, that the resistance of the stress one gradually increase, but at the same time, due to the uh, cross resistance or collateral sensitivity, that the resistance of the other stresses will uh, changes. So by which the we can reconstruct it, uh, we, we can reconstruct it uh, trajectory of the uh, evolution dynamics in the resistance space, high dimensional resistance space. Okay. And so uh, to uh, test uh, this uh, analy analysis of the evolution trajectory, so first we use that uh, very simple cases in which that uh, we use a two-dimensional resistance space uh, in, in which that the X and Y axis is represent the minimum inhibitory concentration to the chloral phenicol and amikacin. And our previous study showed that uh, uh, these two antibiotics, where both of them feature the protein sensing inhibitor, and these two antibiotics uh, show that the collateral sensitivity to each other. I mean that uh, when that the cell that acquire that the chloramphenicol uh, chlor chlor resistance, it became more sensitive to the uh, amikacin and vice versa. This, there is a trade-off between that uh, resistance acquisition. And here is that, uh, some example of the trajectory on that uh, two-dimensional resistance space. 
And this result is a uh, shows the selection by amikacin, and this blue dot is the initial point. And we override the four trajectory under the selection by amikacin for 30 days. And um, because the we select the cell by uh, amikacin resistance, so that the MIC to amikacin gradually increase, but at the same time, due to the collateral sensitivity, that the resistance to chrome phenicol gradually increase like this. And in, in contrast, when we selected the cell by the chloramphenicol, that we put that cell to the upper side, and the chloramphenicol resistance increase like this, but at the same time, that the amikacin resistance decrease like this. And by merging that these two trajectories, so we can see that some clear trade of line uh, between the amikacin and the chloramphenicol resistance like this. And uh, questions uh, here is that uh, whether that uh, this uh, phenotype, the possible phenotype is a constraint on this trade of line or uh, other direction of diversion is possible. Uh, so to check that this possibility, uh, this uh, uh, possibility, so now we are trying to develop the method to control the evolutionary trajectory towards the de desired target like this. Uh, so let us consider that the uh, uh, excuse me? high dimension. Excuse yes. Me? So in this case, so collect collateral sensitivity to each other, that means if uh, yeah. it is strong to A, it's also strong to B. And if it's uh, evolved to strong to B, A, then it's uh, also strong to B. And if it evolved to strong to B, it's also strong to A. So no, this, no, no. Uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it's not uh, no. it, to each other, it's uh, it, not, not like that, it's uh, more, if you try to evolve collateral C to strong to CP, then it's weaker mm -hmm. to AMK. K? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So when, when, yeah, when we select it, that, uh, uh, when we put the selection pressure to the strong that uh, CP resistance, that uh, uh, equal cells decrease that uh, uh, resistance uh -huh. to amikacin. Okay. okay, so, so each so, other means that if uh, it's strong to CP, it's uh, weaker to AMK, K, and if yes, it's uh, right, right. stronger to AMK, it's uh, weaker to CP. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So he, uh, here is a trade off, uh -huh. uh, like, like this line. So yes. if you, we, if that uh, equal cells increase at the AMK resistance, they decrease at the chromophenicol resistance, like this. And by uh, and when we put that the upper side that, that they decrease that the amikacin resistance like this, okay. <clears throat> okay, so, and so uh, and okay, so and the question is that the uh, whether so we can so overcome or so this uh, trade off where we can control that uh, uh, we can realize that the uh, evolution trajectory towards a different direction. And to check uh, this pos uh, possibility, so now we are developing the methodology to uh, control the uh, evolution trajectory, uh, control, uh, control evolution trajectory towards the target state. Here, that, uh, let me consider that some resistance space, and here we put the target state, and the current state here is a problem that how we can design that the selection pressure towards the target. So by changing that the uh, drug concentration or independently. And we uh, realize that this kind of the, uh, regulation by using the very simple feedback regulation. Uh, but anyway, so we can uh, design that the selection pressure towards the target by combination of that the uh, concentration gradient of the drugs, multiple drugs. And here is that the example uh, of the such uh, controlling the evolutionary target state. Here in this, uh, uh, two dimensional resistance space of the amikacin and the chloramphenicol that I, uh, we put that the target state here, and we can see that the trajectory towards target like this. Okay. And, uh, and in, this, in this figure, so we put uh, the target state right here. And uh, in this case is that the uh, evolution, evolutionary trajectory towards the target it seems a bit difficult, but anyway, that the sum, uh, slight changes toward the target were observed. And this direction is that the, uh, different from that the single drug condition like this. This is just the red fly. So, so we can uh, 
design that the evolutionary trajectory towards target now. And this is, uh, this is an example of the two-dimensional resistance space, but now we are trying to expand so this methodology to more high-dimensional uh, resistance space. For example, this is an example of the three-dimensional uh, re resistance space uh, and controlling the evolutionary trajectory towards the target. Here, that the initial state is around here, and the target state is around here. So that this red dot is a target, and that uh, we put that uh, eight trajectory with eight replica lines. Uh, as you can see, that some trajectories are overshooted, but anyway, that uh, we can see that the some uh, trajectory towards the target. So we now, so we can uh, we can put that uh, many different targets and uh, many different trajectory can be observed. Now, so we, in currently, so that we are try, uh, expanding the this method for the eight-dimensional resistance space. Now that we achieved that some controlling the phenotype uh, by using the, this kind of the, the, uh, methodology. And uh, in near future, so we are, we will try to investigate that the uh, uh, effect of that the changing the target structure that the uh, to quantify that the evolvability. Here, I evolvability mean that the, okay, let us consider that the two dimensional resistance space, and we can pre prepare that the many different initial state and. For each initial state, we can design that the evolutionary trajectory uh, to different direction. And for some direction, uh, evolution is easy. Or for, uh, for some direction, the evolution is easy. And for some direction, it's uh, evolution is difficult. So some that the uh, uh, difficulty of the evolution can be quantified by this methodology, the control of the evolutionary target. So that the one, one good point for that, that this uh, method is that we can set uh, that the direction of the selection pressure by ourselves. So by which we can design that this kind of that uh, experiment, and by based on this data, so we might be able to that estimate the landscape. So which direction, uh, which direction the evolution is easier, the which direction is difficult, or something like this, and this landscape. So. At a glance, uh, it looks like a fitness landscape, but it is not a fitness landscape. Instead, so this is a uh, landscape representing that uh, evolvability. So, and so actually, that for some directions, the evolution is possible, some directions are difficult. And so, some, uh, that, uh, as uh, maybe that, as Kuni explained, that the uh, possible uh, evolutionary trajectory might be constrained on low dimensional dynamics. This means that uh, some, for some direction, that the evolution is easy, and for some direction, for example, also orthogonal directions, that the evolution might be difficult. And by using that this kind of methodology, we expect is that such uh, constraint. Uh, can be uh, accessed directly, quantified directly. So this is our, our ongoing project to understand that the low dimensionality of the evolutionary dynamics. Okay, so so maybe time is over, I guess. Uh, so uh, okay, let me uh, okay. So uh, let me summarize the, my uh, presentation. So uh, we uh, we said that uh, we develop that some uh, automated system for that the high throughput experimental evolution and uh, by which that we can perform that uh, uh, we can analyze that the phenotypic and genotypic changes for that the various different environmental conditions and by uh, analyzing the data so uh, we uh, can see that some major axes of the phenotypic changes on which the pos possible uh, phenotypic changes are uh, uh, constrained and uh, by using the, this kind of methodology so that we can uh, make the some more so quantitative theories for the adaptation of the evolution by macroscopic variable and so it might uh, it will so make that possible to the, the prediction and the control of, of the evolution and so this is a uh, acknowledgement so many lab members are uh, contributed to this project and uh, thank you for your attention Thank you very much. Uh, beautiful, beautiful talk. Uh, thank you. I have a question. 
Um, regarding this plot of the observed uh, resistance or the predicted mm -hmm. resistance uh, versus the observed resistance, you had this, uh, this plot. I don't know if you can show it again. Uh, you had these red Sorry. dots at the experiment after the analysis uh, of the minimum of the maximum correlation. Uh, there was this uh, predict no. exactly this thing. So yeah, this uh, in the right uh, plot in the right plot. Yeah. Um, so when the observed resistance. So I understand that mm -hmm. here there are two kinds. There are two two sets of of um, stresses. Those that improve mm -hmm. uh, resistance and those that worsen resistance. Is that correct? I mean, uh, when the the observed resistance is the logarithm of the ratio mm -hmm. of the minimum inhibitory concentration between the mutant, the Wolf mutant, and mm -hmm. the parent. So in principle, mm -hmm. yeah. if this concentration decreases of the mutant mm -hmm. relative to the parent, the logarithm is negative, means that the fitness has yeah. decreased. I mean, how this relates to the fitness, the fact that this observed resistance is positive or negative? Yes, so of course that uh, after uh, after the experimental evolution and uh, that uh, uh, resistance will increase. Okay, and uh, under that uh, um, uh, re, uh, drug is used for the selection, that the uh, resistance is generally increase, always increase in my samples. But at the same time, so for some uh, stresses, that the uh, resistance will decrease for that. Uh, for one, okay, let uh, so let me take that uh, some resistance strength for the stress A. So of course that the uh, uh, MIC for the stress A will increase. This means that the positive value around here. Uh, but for, for same strain that uh, for other stresses it can decrease. For okay. other stresses you, by that acquisition of the resistance to A. So here it's a uh, many negative values. So we, we put that, uh, uh, that uh, all data uh, coming from that uh, single uh, evolved strains. So for, si for each strain, so we put that uh, 48, uh, 48 dots, which can have that both positive and uh, negative values. I see. Is it the answer, answer for your question? Yeah, yeah. So no, my question also was, is there a direct relation between these measurements at this stage? Um, that you are showing here in this slide, is there a direct mm -hmm. uh, inference we can make or uh, about the fitness? Can we say something? Can we quantify fitness in a way from these measurements of resistance? Is there a direct relation between resistance and fitness? Uh, or fitness is a different I, quantity? And re uh, I see. OK. Uh, so this depends on the fitness. Uh, this depends on the definition of the fitness in this case. And uh, I use, uh, of course, that uh, uh, in my experiment, that the uh, fitness is that the uh, uh, concentration of that uh, the MIC, that the minimum inhibitory concentration, it corresponds to the fitness because that uh, we uh, we only that uh, we take that only the cells uh, that are close to the MIC, so and uh, that the fitness corresponds to the MIC in this case. But at the same time, it's different kinds of the fitness can be, for example, just uh, for example, growth rate uh, without adding that uh, drugs. And such growth rate is generally decreased by the acquisition of the resistance of drugs. So uh, I, I mean that I, so fitness depends on the definition. So what fitness, so now you are asking. I don't know. <laughs> I'm asking precisely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My yeah, yeah. question so, is precisely course, that, course, what is the fitness here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In this case, uh, fitness is a uh, concentration of the drugs. Is that the minimum inhibitory concentration of the drugs? This is a fitness. Okay. But so other fitness can be possible for the other uh, environment. Okay, I see. I see. Okay, so you are directly measuring the fitness. Let's put it this way. So now that uh, you mean that uh, fitness, if that the fitness is a minimum inhibitory concentration, so we can measure that that is. Uh, uh, how that uh, cell concentration depend on that the drug drug concentration. 
So, in, so higher concentration ranges the cells cannot grow. That the low concentration ranges, uh, low con low drug concentration ranges, cells can grow, and high drug concentration ranges, cells cannot grow. And uh, it, there is some boundary, so we can define that the minimum inhibitor concentration around here. So this is a way to uh, determine that the minimum inhibitor concentration. And here uh, we use that this value as a fitness. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, can I ask a question? Maybe not a question, yes. but just to make sure that I understand the key message of your talk. It's very uh, mm -hmm. interesting talk, by the way. So um, this, so the aim, uh, the message of the talk is that control and prediction are possible, not because of the existence of some fitness, well-defined fitness, but it's rather mm -hmm. because of the low dimensionality in the genotype mm -hmm. genotype mapping right mm -hmm. yeah yeah so yes this this yeah. slide i mean that's like yeah, yeah. so because yeah, the, yeah. in the feature space so the feature space have small number of components so now in the case that you show because of that yeah. the feature space is the way you map between the genotype and phenotype and yeah. since that yeah. uh, feature space uh, is low dimensional then it is possible yeah. to make prediction and yeah. and control. Yeah. If if yeah. not this is the case, then no way to make the prediction and control, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, uh, what I want to so uh, present so in this study is that uh, predict and because that uh, there is a low dimensionality uh, between the, the pheno in the phenotype, so it makes us to the uh, it makes us possible to predict. The behavior. If that uh, this relationship is really high dimensional, it is almost impossible to predict the behavior, right? Uh, but the, uh, at the same time, the correspondence between the, the genotype and the phenotype is uh, much so uh, complicated in my data. So that the relationship between the, the genotype and the phenotype might be more complicated and more high dimensional. But phenotype is somehow uh, constrained on low dimensional space so by which that we can so phenotype can be predicted Gen genetic change is difficult to, rather difficult to be predicted this thank is uh, what our data is saying thank you thank you uh, actually i have many questions okay so so referring to felix's questions so maybe one mm -hmm. confusing point is that the plot of this prediction error plot that is obtained for, that, that plot is given for a single strain, for given strain, and across uh, no, many uh, different uh, environmental conditions? Yes, or, or but, I, uh, yeah, so, so this is that, uh, uh, this plot is obtained that uh, all uh, 192, uh, to 192 uh, evolved strains for each stresses. Oh. So that the number of the data points are very huge. So, so actually, you have many, many strains and many, many yeah. environmental conditions, and you can right. yeah. Yeah, plot all of this. And then, yeah, yeah then this uh, is well pre predicted. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. and, and that means, so later you show that uh, if this is strong to chloramphenicol and this is uh, strong to MK or something like that. So that, that yeah. is also predicted from this uh, nine-dimensional yes. model. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh, this, uh, so this change, so at least in my, at least end point, so uh, this, this changes is, uh, this relationship also uh, can be predicted that, for example, this point, this point can be predicted by that, uh, just the expression changes. So if we have the data on this, that uh, expression changes, of these the trajectory, so we can predict the how the time actually changes. So basically, this kind of trade-off structure in this case is yeah. given by this nine-dimensional as a result of this yeah, yeah, nine-dimensional exactly. yeah. dynamical system. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And then I often <laughs> ask about this uh, Onsaga reciprocity works <laughs> or not, and yeah. so if it, <laughs> this is strong to A, evolve to yeah, strong yeah. to A, it's also strong to B, or so in this case, yeah. so somehow it works. If uh, evolved yeah, to yeah. A, yeah. then it's yeah. negative to B, and B evolved to yeah. B, it's negative to A. Uh, and yeah. 
Exactly. This is uh, true to many other cases. So, or so, if it um, is not, strong not, to A, yeah, also I, strong to B, and B evolved to strong to B, also strong to A. So either plus plus or either plus minus uh, minus plus. That, that's yeah, uh, yeah, it, always. Yeah, plus, of course, that plus, plus plus exists and plus zero exists. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, relationship, it, yeah, of course, that, uh, we can see that this kind of the, uh, the minus minus relationship uh, mm. in some cases. Mm. Uh, but so not always. Uh -huh. So so how 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 common is this uh, the case that Onsaga reciprocity works? So so that means this dynamics is somehow kind of represented by nine-dimensional potential structure or something like that, isn't it? Yeah. I th yeah. Mm. Yes. So actually, uh, it. Uh, how to say? So it's difficult to say that uh, some uh, fraction, how many fraction that the uh, saga is first it but it's but uh, um, yes, uh, it is a bit difficult to answer. Of course, that uh, I I can say that uh, this uh, complete the uh, uh, correlation matrix as well, uh, but. Uh, uh, now, so for, uh, what I can say is that uh, for some cases that uh, this kind of relationship exists, and for other cases not, or something like uh -huh. It's a bit difficult. But, but, but that should be pre predicted from this nine-dimensional dynamical system. So if yeah, this yeah, is yeah, a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you have some kind yeah. of a cyclic, cyclic uh, flow around there, uh, maybe yeah. some, uh, uh. yeah, kind of a, that that violates on Saga. Yeah. Yeah, cyclic flow, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I will try again. <laughs> and another, so prediction in this case, so, so, so you so try to evolve this, but uh, before evolution, so in this direction of this, uh, so mm -hmm. trade-off direction, so yeah. before evolution, if you take this kind of a, some strain, and then just mm -hmm. by mutation, I don't know, just by noise, in that direction, yeah. it's more easily to change. So it's in that sense, so some kind of relationship to evolvability direction yeah, and yeah. the changeability yeah. direction in noise, yeah. that is correlated? or. Yeah, uh, actually, that uh, uh, for that uh, expression noise, so uh, that the data is a bit difficult to take. Uh -huh. uh, but so uh, we can ma uh, we have many data for that the uh, environmental response of the E. coli cells. Uh -huh. I mean that the uh, uh, transcriptome changes or uh, transcriptome change of the E. coli cells obtained under many different environment is available, and so uh, we can see that the clear correlation between that. Uh, uh, direction of the uh, uh, easy uh, direction between the uh, phenotypic uh, e, uh, how easy to the phenotypic uh, uh, environmental response and how easy to the evolutionary response. There is a clear correlation for that the variance for that uh, uh, variance between the uh, environmental response and the evolutionary response. Uh -huh. So it, it, it and so and also it uh, it uh, can. Uh, correspond well with that, that's, for example, nine, nine so major axes or something like this. Uh -huh. So in the next part, you try to make uh, this to evolve to yeah. the cells that are both strong, both to A and B, so C, yeah, 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 yeah. And of yeah. course, that is uh, more difficult. Yeah. But can you some kind quantify such kind of difficulty? in some yes. way of this uh, <laughs> nature so, of yeah, this so, uh, di dynamics? Yes, so this is uh, uh, what we will try to next. Uh -huh. For example, that, that this direction is my difficult, and this direction is easy, or something like this. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, what we will try to next. Uh -huh. I see. Uh, to make that by, by taking the data from the, the many different points in the, this resistance space, 
and the thumbs are smoothing the, these data so we can see that uh, this kind of the landscape. So, so for the, this direction that the uh, evolution is difficult and this direction is easy or something like this. Okay. So, but if you know that uh, you can make a very dangerous bacteria that is uh, strong to any biotics or something. Yeah, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, that, that might be interesting. Uh, but of course, that it is a bit uh, dangerous. Yeah, actually, that this trade is a very. I, I feel that this trade is very strong. So actually, that we know that the molecular mechanism of this, uh, how that this trade of the emerges. And this is just based on the some metabolic shift uh, that depend on the proton transport through the membrane. But uh, I'm a bit surprised it's that, that some cells can overcome this trade-off. And uh, uh, we, uh, this is a very interesting thing that uh, uh, we will try to understand how such difficult evolution is realized by the some genetic change or genetic changes. <laughs> so that might be make that some dangerous stories. <laughs> I'm not sure. OK, so any other questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. okay, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.